Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Pepper Giese, Eric Holm, and Carmine Bailey. Coming up on DTNS, can an AI diagnose Alzheimer's disease? Dr. Nikki helps us understand what's true and what isn't about a new study. Plus, pop-up ads may be coming to streaming. And do we really want new cell phone designs? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 24th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Also from Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. I'm coming at you from New York City, Dr. Nikki Ackerman. It's me. And uh, hoping for a cooler weekend on the show's producer, Roger Chang. Ah, from your lips to God's ears, Roger. Uh, (laughs) We have got a good show for you today, so let's start with a few tech things you should know. Next month, Microsoft will start notifying Windows 8.1 users... I mean, I use the plural optimistically, (laughs) that the OS will reach its end of support date on January 10th, 2023. That means it'll stop receiving security updates. It already stopped receiving regular updates. After January 10th, 2023, y'all are on your own. No more security updates from Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft does not even plan to offer extended security updates for that particular version of the OS, although it had done that for Windows 7. Leave my mom alone. According to an investor note from Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo, as seen by 9to5Mac, Apple will likely announce its mixed reality headset in January of 2023. The note also predicts Meta may pull back on near-term VR hardware investments to refocus on the core advertising business model. Twitter, uh, I'm sorry, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and the U.S. Coast Guard published a joint alert warning that organizations are still seeing active exploitation of unpatched VMware Horizon and Unified Access Gateway servers uh, that have the log for shell vulnerability. The alert wanted that warned that state-sponsored groups are exploiting these flaws and that it's seen organizations compromised by multiple threat actor groups. So get it fixed, y'all. Twitter announced that its button to toggle captions for its video player is now available on the public or to the public on iOS and Android. The button is in the top right corner of the video, and if it has captions available, let you choose whether you want to see written descriptions. The company has started a limited test of this feature uh, in April. Walmart announced Thursday it's developed a way to switch seamlessly between cloud providers and its own servers, so hybrid cloud, which potentially could save the company millions of dollars and offer options other organizations looking to reduce their dependence on giant technology companies might want to look into and copy. Walmart's new hybrid system uses third-party platforms from Microsoft, Google, and its own internal server network, uh, which it built out across Walmart facilities around the country. All right, let's talk about nothing. The phone. (laughs) Let's not start an Abbott and Costello routine, right? Not this time. Uh, Nothing opened pre-order reservation deposits. Pre-order reservation deposits. They just call it pre-order reservations, but they charge you. Uh, This is for the phone one, the nothing phone one device. Uh, If you get an invite code, (laughs) so you can't just do it. You need to get invited. Then you can put down 20 pounds a non-refundable deposit Mm. that will be applied to the purchase price if you follow through on the order. Uh, Everyone else goes on a wait list, and then new invites for you to be allowed to give them your 20-pound deposit will go out in batches. Uh, The phone one will open for all pre-orders on July 12th. Uh, That may sound convoluted to some of you, but it's actually a system that Nothing founder Carl Pace, former company OnePlus, used for years to help manage supply and drum up interest. Uh, another way to drum up interest is to have pay sit down with Engadget and throw shade on the rest of the cell phone industry. What happened there, Lamar? Yeah, so pay, like a lot of us folks feel that phones are just aren't as special as they used to be. I, I kind of share this. Mm. But unlike most, most of us, he thinks he knows what the problem is. So there are fewer companies making flagship phones these days. We know that. And they all work in the same parts from Qualcomm, Sony, and Samsung. And pretty much the same consumer research data. Boring, 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 right? So they all end up making very similar phones. Or as Pay puts it, if the input is the same and the method is the same, the output is more or less the same as well. Yeah, It kind of makes sense. I agree with them here. It's like, yeah, they're all working from the same playbook, so it's no surprise that the phones kind of look the same. Uh, Pay says they intentionally used intuition at nothing when designing the phone one, leading to design elements like the transparent case, uh, making the heat pump at the bottom of the phone look like a tiny little elephant. 
Uh, and the signature feature of the of the phone one is the 900 LEDs on the back. That, that I think that number is accurate. There are 900 LEDs on the back. Uh, those are used as a notification system that can do things like uh, a red light to indicate that video is being recorded, uh, patterns and colors that you can assign to contacts along with sounds. So you don't have to look at the screen to see who's calling. You're like, oh, it's flashing green and playing Marvin Gaye. Must be Lamar. Uh, lights glow differently when it is charging versus reverse charging. And LEDs by the charging port indicate how much power is left in the battery at a glance. Okay, so those are different, but... Do we need our phones to be different? Dr. Nikki, I'm curious as a phone user yourself, like all of us, uh, do you feel like, oh, these phones are boring. I wish they were cool again. Yeah, I want a cool phone. I want a, like a little elephant on my phone. <laughs> um, well, we don't know what we're missing until it comes out, right? So I encourage trying new stuff. Some of it will probably flop, but that's fine. I like the LEDs on the back. I wonder if they can be used as a ring light. I feel like that's something that so many people are using oh, right now. Oh. Not me right now, but <laughs> but some people. Um, yeah, innovation's always good. It, mostly always good. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, gonna play I, the curmudgeon here, Labar. What about you? Okay. So I, I, I'm I'm kind of with her. I, I like. I, I like the idea of changing it around. Like I, I initially, like I have the if it's not broke, don't fix it model. But, but phones, I used to re, I used to do technology videos on phones. They're they're you know when they were exciting when Android was out, they're boring now. Like like yeah. it's just so many of them coming out. There's nothing interesting about them. We need a way to spice up these so I can make another channel and get famous again. So <laughs> it's re, it's really important that we follow through on this, people. I disagree. I think phones, we got them to a point where they work well. And if you try too much stuff, you're just going to make them not work as well. And they're not going to be as compelling. I, I don't, mm. I don't disagree with what Carl pay is doing. I think somebody needs to try stuff. So I'm, I'm with yeah. y'all to a certain extent, which is I'm glad somebody's trying some things because maybe most of them won't work, but some of them will. And then we'll learn and get some new innovation. I'm cool with that. I'm not bothered by phones being, being, you know, uninteresting there. That just means it's a mature product category. I'm also, you know, not bothered that the, the laundry device I buy is uninteresting and, and not, doesn't have cool new features. In fact, when they try to put too many cool new features in a laundry machine, it makes it confusing. Laptops, same uh, way. Like okay. they work a c certain way and that's good. You want them to be predictable devices. They're commodity devices now. Uh, uh, okay, that, that laundry thing was very old man right there. I'm the sorry. Old man like, like, now. Like, like, <laughs> the idea, if, if I get one machine, I know they exist, by the way, that you can put laundry in, it washes and dries, and that's a that's a that's that's what everybody has, because I know it's really expensive right now. I, that's an innovation I want to see, that the progress. Something can that's be done better I, than this. No, 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 I know what you're... That's a new product category, though. I'm talking oh. about when they're like, we put all these like special alert ringtones on your... I'm like, I don't need that. I just need it to wash well. Does it It'll wash well? That's what I It'll out through time. The bad stuff will fall <laughs> by the wayside, just like Ex how exactly. 80s music is great. All the bad stuff, we don't <laughs> listen to it anymore. And Thank you. Get, like, I like you. Holograms. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, I, I agree. And that's why I said I'm glad somebody's doing it. I'm glad I'm nothing glad I'm is not doing, doing it. it. I don't have to but worry about the stuff that fails. I guess what I'm saying is I'm glad exactly. nothing is trying things out because somebody does need to do that. But I don't fault Samsung and Apple and Google uh, for for coming up with phones that work well, you know, without, you know, without trying a bunch of new things and, and putting it out there and we're like oh that was an interesting idea but i hate it you know you, you, you need to th there's a point in a product cycle where you just realize that this is how it works and when the iphone first came out it was an innovation on top of trios and blackberries that said maybe you can do it without a keyboard and i'm glad they did that and mm -hmm. then we we iterated on that for several generations, finding out, okay, once you have a touchscreen, what else can you do? And that was exciting, but there's a certain point where it just works and you're like, okay, this is what you can do with a touchscreen. Now, if you come up with a new form factor or the equivalent of, you know, the dryer and the laundry together in one thing, <laughs> then I'm interested again. But if, if all you're doing is putting LEDs on the back, I'm glad somebody's doing that, but I don't really think everybody has to do that. I, I I get your point. There was there was a lot of pushback from the because Trio was my favorite phone. Was pushback from that 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 to a uh, you know it took a while to get people used to the, the typing on a screen. So I I I I think people have to 
you know, be li- be open minded with these with, with these type of yeah, advances. Yeah. And I, and I and you know, I, I think that's what I makes it exciting that. again. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing mind blowing coming out right now, but maybe nothing. they can build on it. I guess all I'm saying is uh in 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 older product lines like phones have become, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be mind blowing all the time. I do want a hologram though, so they should work on that. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. Well, See, that's that that pre show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I want too. <laughs> all right. Uh a big thanks to PJC Reese for submitting this on our subreddit uh and bringing it to our attention at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Scientists at Imperial College London published a paper paper in Nature Portfolio Journal Communications Medicine describing a machine learning algorithm they developed to aid diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh the team adapted an algorithm that had been developed to classify cancer tumors, but instead trained it on archived MRI scans from more than 400 patients who had either early or late stage Alzheimer's disease and a control group of patients with other neurological conditions like Parkinson's or frontotemporal dementia. They divided the brain into 115 regions and assessed each region for structural features like size, shape, texture, etc. There were like 660 categories. The algorithm was trained to identify when changes to these features predicted the existence of Alzheimer's disease, and in their paper, they said it accurately detected Alzheimer's disease in 98% of the cases they tried and could distinguish early and late stage in 79% of cases. So this sounds very promising. Dr. Nikki, what do you think? All right. I'm excited about this one. This is like smack dab in the middle of my field. So I'll start by saying any advances in Alzheimer's disease research are big advances because we don't have a lot to go on because the problem is that we can't diagnose it in living people. So this is a step towards that. It's not like, of course, the title of the news says that a single MRI scan can detect Alzheimer's. Not exactly right now in living patients, Um, especially with what they're doing. Okay, so I'm going to break it down. They trained an an AI to look at archived MRI images, so images that were already made on people a while ago, likely on experimental MRI machines, so they're much higher definition than the one that you would usually get scanned on, and they're much more expensive, which is why they're not as widespread. And they compared the Alzheimer's and other brains to healthy brains, right? So AI is good at looking at patterns and saying, this is this pattern, and assigning images And that's why they did that, which is really cool. Another way that the way that they were able to tell the AI or the machine learning system, I know we're not really supposed to say AI on here, uh, what pattern they're using. So they looked at three things, cognitive scale, which is basically behavioral changes and things that you'll associate with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, This is linked to each MRI image. Um, Then differences in brain textures and brain sort of shape on the MRI images. Um, and also something called biomarkers in the cerebrospinal fluid. This is basically a way to track through specific proteins whether this disease is present or not using this liquid that your brain floats in. It's not really 100% accurate, though. So, uh, yeah, so this is where my sort of limitations come in on this, right? This is cool, but... um, Tracking the biomarkers in your cerebrospinal fluid, not clinically used to diagnose Alzheimer's because you can't be 100% sure. So it's like a helper data. Um, and is, that, is that because you really can't 100% confirm someone had Alzheimer's until after they're dead and look yes. at the, the brain, right? Yeah. Thanks for bringing that back up. Okay. Right now, the only way to 100% confirm that you had Alzheimer's or similar diseases is by looking, dissecting the brain, yeah. which is why we're bad at telling if people have Alzheimer's because you can't do it while they're alive really well. So they had to have that data to sort of confirm the data in this study. So this is why it's not really completely doable on live people, also because of the different MRI machines and because, yeah, there, there's things to, like you need to work on improving MRI technology and biomarker technology to apply, like to be able to sit down at the hospital, get an MRI and be like, you have Alzheimer's. Because yeah, yeah. Because I think that's what here, everybody wants, right? They're like, great, yeah, scan me this now. Is not, this is yeah. not that. <laughs> but and, and that's because it, that's because this may not be quite as accurate because, you know, it's based on archived scans. It's not based on yeah, accurate so scans, Yeah, so they right? took these scans and analyzed the data and applied the the uh, machine learning to that. And that, that took them years. It's not like you sit down and there's a software. Right. But they're working towards that, which is the exciting part. 
Um, and this is really cool because this is exactly what I'm working on. So I'm trying to help move this needle forward as well, but I do it on sheep um, because <laughs> It's easier sheep, to work with dead sheep than dead humans, basically. Um, uh, also, the other thing that I'm not so sure about is the like brain regions that they worked on. They said that they looked at different brain regions and the brain texture. I don't know what that is. Yeah. But I, okay. yeah. So and, more detail, more detail would, like, would be needed. Yeah. Yeah. And things like cortical thickness. So the thickness of the brain section, um, that's only visible in really, really late Alzheimer's disease which you can already see in the MRI with the naked mm -hmm. eye anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, we're getting there, but we're not there. Uh, so I'm glad I was able to break this down because the title is a little bit misleading as this, usual. Some of that would come out in the wash because of the way machine learning works, which is like, I don't know, we pointed at a bunch of stuff and it got really good at predicting. We don't even know what parts it was looking at, mm -hmm. what parts were important and part, what parts weren't. Machine learning a little bit of a black box that way. So yeah. if it was able to get really good at predicting, I'd say like, well, it could at least be used as an aid to diagnosis, but that's where the other thing came in where you're like, yeah, but these scans are not the MRI that you could use every day. Is that right? Yeah. And they can build on that. So some of the samples were from a daily, a usual MRI. So this is basically like pushing the needle towards being able to do it on okay. live people. Like the fact that this algorithm exists. Um, but the other science needs to catch up to the algorithm basically gotcha. to yeah. be able to match all that. What, what what this combined with the standard MRI that you, you would use to to try to diagnose someone now, what but the two combined give you uh in in its current form, like a a whole a better whole picture of what's going on? Or is this it's still too early to if you had really late Alzheimer's, yeah. But then you would mm -hmm. already know that you had really late Alzheimer's because you'd be showing behavioral signs. So yeah, yeah. the mm -hmm. early Alzheimer's is really the tough one and right. it's still tough. It's just yeah. yeah. So yeah. so the upshot here is great study, good news, but as with most published studies, there needs to be more work for it to become a practical thing that most of us can benefit. Yeah, from. story of my life. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. I've gotten really practiced at saying that myself on the show. But <laughs> but this is great news, right? It it, it yeah, is something cool. where it's it really does cool. look uh it does look optimistic that we can build on it, right? Someday, someday. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just needs to, to have today. more people like yourself uh, contributing to the, the data pool. Yeah, fund my Patreon. No, I don't have a Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> fund your research directly. Yeah. 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 Uh, join in the conversation also. in our Discord. Can you fund to scientific research? Let us know. We know who to put you in touch with. Uh, or if you just have thoughts or questions about this, uh, you can join our Discord by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. <laughs> So we've heard, Tom, that uh, Netflix is considering an ad-supported tier. A lot of sources say this is happening. Uh, but now we have the official word, the official word from the Netflix co-CEO, Ted Serendos. Yeah, indeed. At the Can Lion at Li Lyon? Is it because it's in French? I don't know. Uh, Can Lions Advertising Festival. Serendos not only confirmed the plans are going ahead, but explained why Netflix has changed its mind because it used to be against implementing ads, uh, Serendo said, we've left a big customer segment off the table, which is people who say, hey, Netflix is too expensive for me and I don't mind advertising. He also added, we're not adding ads to Netflix as you know it today. We're adding an ad tier for folks who say, hey, I want a lower price and I'll watch ads. I think he's trying to calm down people who are like, oh, so you're going to put ads in my tier. No, if you have Netflix today, that you're not getting ads. This will be a new mm -hmm. offering. Uh, he would not clarify what partners Netflix is talking to to implement the ads. Apparently, Google and NBC Universal are the rumors. Sarandos only said, we're talking to all of them right now. Uh, so he's not letting on who they prefer. Sarandos explained that they want a, quote, pretty easy entry to the market, but... That, quote, what we do at first will not be representative of what the product will be ultimately. I want our product to be better than TV. He added that the company wants to build an ad experience that is, quote, more integrated and less interruptive. Now, that's interesting. So Variety had an observation that might shed light on the kind of thing that Netflix would do. Now, Fox News' subscription service called Fox Nation has been running banner ads from Camping World on the bottom third of its screen during episodes of Duck Dynasty. I mean, that kind of makes sense. 
and the uh, service plans to continue promote uh, promotional billboards, as they call them, uh, to use these rather than interrupting a show with the traditional 30 second ad spots. So I know a lot of folks here don't like the idea of ads interrupting a show, but what if the ads didn't interrupt, but just pop up at the bottom? How do you think we'll feel about that? Nobody likes ads. I don't know. I feel like it's nefarious, but also less annoying, but also I still don't want ads. <laughs> yeah. I, um, ads is one of those fraught topics because everyone claims that they hate ads and they'll never pay for them. And yet the statistics show that there are people who are lying because people do pay for services yes. with ads. We also hate giving away more money than we want to. So yeah. Yeah. For so I, when the, when the rubber hits the road, uh, people do end up uh, supporting these services and subscribing to these services. So we know it's not you, but somebody out there is doing it. Uh, I do think it's compelling to say we are not going to interrupt the show, especially because Netflix content particularly is not built for ad breaks. Mm -hmm. there, there are no natural ad breaks in a Netflix show, so it'd be kind of hard for them mm -hmm. to reverse engineer that. But a pop-up, so they could do pre-rolls and post-rolls, obviously, but a pop-up that just shows up in the lower third, that would not interrupt the flow of the show. It would cover some part of the show, but usually the lower third is left with you know less essential information when you're filming stuff. You keep the the central information towards the center, which is why lower thirds are where you put graphics in in most TV content. So, I hmm. I, I I see that it solves that problem, but it also could potentially introduce other problems of oh, but there was important information down there, or it's distracting and I don't like it, you know, or it's irrelevant. That's usually the problem with ads. We love ads when we don't think they're ads because we want the information. We hate ads when they're irrelevant to us. Mm -hmm. So, so this is kind of interesting because initially, I know someone said in the chat that doesn't YouTube already do this? And yes, YouTube does have a, a banner that pops on top. Now, when I talked to you about this pre-show, I was under the, the assumption this would somehow like raise the screen up a little bit mm -hmm. and pop pop underneath kind of like what is this called science a little little things that that run like uh like like under like 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 a banner roll that like on news stations yeah, yeah like yeah. it's right it's right under the main yeah. the scroll something something like that where it's not interrupting at all but if it's not a ticker gonna it, it will have to kind of letterbox your content a little bit to pop up in order to do that and i'm thinking that's that is that a disruption people would tolerate or would they tolerate a youtube like banner jumping over to, on top of the content yeah i'll uh, be honest uh what they're describing here from fox is the the banner that pops up on the bottom and then goes away uh it doesn't squeeze back the content at least i don't think it, it does. doesn't squeeze it okay yeah uh but netflix might do something that's more like you're saying, uh, because a lot of times on sports now, especially sports that don't have as many timeouts like soccer, they'll squeeze back the picture and put an ad to the side. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I wonder if Netflix wants to do something like that. Maybe that's why he's like, well, we're not going to, you know, have the exact product at the very beginning, but eventually we'll get there. Like they may be looking at that kind of technology as well. I wonder yeah, if I'm that's going to um, interrupt subtitles too, for people who. Mm -hmm. use that. Oh, interesting. Usually, with the squeeze backs and stuff, it doesn't. Um, yeah, squeeze back might be. The but answer. with the lower third, like I know a lot of times those lower thirds can push the captions up to the center of the screen, which can be annoying. Mm -hmm. um, but I, again, I don't know if that's how it works on the on the Fox uh, Nation app or not. That's a good question, though. Yeah, I mean, it seems preferable to just being cut off and interrupted if if you it have is. to choose. Yeah. And it, and it, like I said, it solves that Netflix problem of they don't have ad breaks. So how are they going to put yeah. ads around their their initial shows? I, I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna guess they will do all of these things. They're gonna have yeah. pre roll. They're gonna have post roll. They're gonna yeah. have banner pop ups. They're gonna have the crawl like Lamar was talking about. Like mm -hmm. yeah, they're gonna have the squeeze back. Uh, eventually, maybe not right at launch, but eventually. You'd be you'd be surprised to see how many people would would go for that versus and save five bucks a month. You, oh you, yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah. Why not? They'll never admit it in our chat room. No. <laughs> be paying for it. Exactly. We're all going to be doing it. We won't, just won't tell anyone. <laughs> uh, hey, folks, you want to make your next vacation all about space? Well, Chris Christensen just might have the answer. 
This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. Again, I've got a place for you today, and that is Huntsville, Alabama. If you haven't thought about going to Huntsville, then you probably don't know anything about it because it's a great place for people who like technology because it's the home of both the U.S. Space and Rocket Center as well as the Marshall Space Flight Center. So if you want to stand under with the last remaining Saturn V rockets and talk to one of the docents who probably worked on that rocket or stand on the test center where they tested the engines for the Saturn V rocket high above the Marshall Space Flight Center, then that is a really cool place to go. It's also the home of Space Camp and has more PhDs per capita than any other city in the U.S. Huntsville, Alabama is worth a look. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I actually, uh, my, my uncle lived in Alabama and when we visited him when I was a kid, like I was about 12 years old, uh, we, we went to the Huntsville Space Center and the Saturn V rocket was just as impressive back then as I imagine it is now. Probably even more so because it's even older. It's tall. I definitely I want to go see, see one of those one day. I've never gone to Houston or any of those places to, to see. Uh, I grew up near Cape Canaveral, so. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> we got yeah. the big wait, did, wait, wait, does Houston have one? I just embarrass myself if it doesn't. Did they have a space center? Please tell me. Uh, well, yeah, the Johnson Space Center is in okay. Houston. Okay. I, I, it's right outside Houston in Johnson City, and you can go visit there. That's where the shuttle simulator is and stuff like oh, that. Okay, yeah. I was going to say we have a problem then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I always heard that Los Alamos had the most PhDs per capita because of the nuclear program, but oh, maybe. really? Yeah, I could I could see that. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of cool places to go. Thank you, Chris Christensen. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, regarding yesterday on the news from Amazon's uh, ability to mimic a long-lost relative, uh, the uh, the ability to train a voice assistant to have the same pattern as someone else, uh, Tim wrote in with some thoughts. Quote, it was exactly this feature that made it interesting, and I went immediately to wondering if had I enough audio or video recordings of my grandmother to pull this off, I lost my grandparents almost 25 years ago and I'm only in my 40s, I didn't get the horror or revulsion at all. And his other marketing techniques would have made me skip right past this. He's talking about the, the marketing techniques that Justin uh, was was saying that Amazon should have done. Tim says, I'm excited to try it. And you can bet the first several voices I'll try are people no longer with us who I miss. I do it. I, I, I do it. I, I think grandma hearing grandma's voice again, especially since we recently lost would be it wouldn't be weird to me. Especially uh, being not, able to make them say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so like yes, you can't have another uh, chocolate cake. Uh, That's exactly honey. where I was. Yeah, going with yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes, you can have more chocolate chip cookies, Tom. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with your political views. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You've always been right. I was. You're my wrong. favorite grandchild. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. I was going to say <laughs> I would probably only do this for certain of my relatives, but now that you've brought that aspect up, I might do it for all of them. You're right. You yeah. can make them say whatever. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I was. I am wrong on everything I have ever said to you, Tom. Yes. Uh, yes, I am. And, and all, ki all kidding aside, uh, my grandpa uh, died in the 50s. Uh, he was born in 1882. We have real-to-real oh, wow. -real recordings of him that my uncle put together. Uh, and I've digitized some of those. If that was enough to make this work and I could hear my grandpa talk, who I never heard in real life, you know, uh, say things like we even have a few of his writings and things that that would be amazing. I'd, that's I'd be really that. fascinating. For narration, wow. That's a really good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the problem is just the general uncanny valiness that people, yeah. the, the gut reaction, right? But why not try it? Yeah, especially the more recent someone has passed, the weirder it is. For sure. You know, yeah. Uh, well, that is it for us today. Thank you, uh, Lamar Wilson, as always, my friend. What's going on? The yes, tell sir. folks about. Well, I do short form entertaining video content on uh, you guys on everywhere. You, literally, you can go to Lamar TV. Uh, if you can follow me on Twitter, I post content there. I recently talked about how Sriracha sucks. So and uh, a lot of people didn't like that. So Contra that's why I posted it. Yes. <laughs> so, so make sure you, you check that out. Lamar TV. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Timing, Lamar. There's a Sriracha shortage. My gosh. Oh, that's why I did it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Nikki, thank you uh, for, for bringing the science today. What do you got going on to tell folks about? Um, I just generally tweet about science. I live tweeted that thread on the Alzheimer's thing on my Twitter at Ackerman's Nicole. My website's at 
NicoleAckermans.com, I believe. Um, so just catch me there. And I'm also hosting the I Am SciComm Twitter account this week, talking about scientific communication, which has been really fun. Yeah, thanks for uh, looping me and Dr. Kiki and, and a bunch of others in on that. That was super fun to bring in the experts, in. man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, special thanks to Sundayu, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thanks for all the years of support, Sundayu. Appreciate you being with us. Uh, folks, if you ride with us every day, Monday through Friday, and if we were like actually in the car with you, uh, would you buy us a cup of coffee? Well, for one cup of coffee per month, actually less, two dollars. You can't get a cup of coffee for two dollars anymore. Uh, you can support the show. So if if that makes sense, if you'd be like, yeah, I'd buy him a cup of coffee. Well, you don't even have to be in the car with us, and uh, we don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Just go to Patreon.com/slash DTNS. That is also where you can get the extended show. We're going to be talking more about stuff on Good Day Internet, patreon.com slash DTNS. We're live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back Monday. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S1, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Gadget Virtuoso, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show included Shannon Morse, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, Lamar Wilson, and Chris Christensen. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>